Hello, and welcome to show number 2316 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. MuseScore really has turned into a, a major player in the market now. So there's Finale, Sibelius, and another uh, relative newcomer, Dorico. But MuseScore is definitely on, you know, close to equal footing with those despite being free and those being pretty expensive packages. And MuseScore has developed into a very accessible package for making even sophisticated musical scores and listening to the music. We'll speak with Mark Sabatella, an educator and one of the developers of MuseScore, about this free open source application and its really good accessibility. But first, for our tip of the week, this week's tip is some good advice from Mark Sabatella about getting started using MuseScore. My biggest tip has to do with that hierarchy of F6 and tab and so forth. It's not a single tip. It's first make an exploration of the user interface using F6 so you understand where the panels are. Then make another tour using tab and so you'll understand the other groupings. And yes, you'll you'll find that it tab is going to move you directly into the next panel. And so it will give you an idea of what's within each panel. Um, but you'll kind of want to have done the F6 tour first. Then you might want to do another tour where as you're tabbing around, you're also using the cursor keys to move in between. It's going to take a minute to find your way around everything because there's a lot there, but my tutorials kind of walk you through the process and should help a lot. That will be very helpful in getting people started with the interface. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by Insight.org, N-S-I-T-E dot O-R-G, and Insight Connect, a job board exclusively designed for individuals who experience vision loss and employers who seek to fill open positions with talent who are blind or have low vision. Job postings are also open to veterans. Insight, a vision for talent. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Mark. Today's guest has been on Eyes on Success with us once before a few years ago. But for people who may not remember you, Mark, and talking about MuseScore, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do. Yes. Hello. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Mark Sabatella, and I am... Um, I'm one of the many volunteers who have contributed to the development of MuseScore, which is the free and open source music notation software. And I've been a music educator for a long time and have had uh, on a couple different occasions blind students in my music theory courses at two different schools where both of them were the first blind students ever to go through the program. And so I got to sort of experience, you know, how to adapt the music uh, curriculum to working with, uh, you know, that sort of accessibility issues and figuring things out as we went along. So I've been a largely self-taught accessibility champion for, for music. And you personally are sighted. Yes, I am. And although you are sighted with the blind students you've had through the years and the fact that you're a music teacher and your previous life was in IT, you have all the right skills and experience to contribute to making MuseScore accessible. Yes, it's very convenient confluence of, of these factors. And, and actually, the first time when I had a student in my class who was blind, MuseScore was not accessible at all. In fact, it wasn't even released yet. It was still, you know, pre-beta, whatever. But um, it was intriguing and it was open source. So I'm like, oh, I could get involved because it was one of my students who told me, well, you should check it out. Maybe that would work for working with uh, Sam, the student. So um, I checked it out. I was like, well, it doesn't work yet, but it's open source. So I'm going to make a note of this and come back to it uh, when I have a minute and uh, see what I can contribute. And that's actually how I got started working with MuseScore. 
Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Underwriting pairs the impact of targeted marketing with the integrity of community goodwill. Learn more by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is MuseScore, a free open source program for creating and listening to musical scores. Now, Mark, you and I first ran into each other several years ago when I started using MuseScore 3, and it was not accessible with the JAWS screen reader. So I hopped on the MuseScore forum, started asking questions, and you quickly engaged in the conversation. And after a few iterations, we found out that we actually live within minutes of each other in Colorado. So I had you come over to my house and showed you how JAWS worked and how the JAWS scripting language worked. And, and pretty soon, MuseScore was accessible with JAWS. Yeah, that was an amazing coincidence that uh, we lived so close together and that you were able to to have me over and show me these things because who knows how things would have progressed otherwise. I had used JAWS to test things out and realized, well, it's not working and I don't know why and uh, we're just going to have to leave it alone. But when we uh, joined Paths, that really helped put things into motion so that uh, we, we were able to figure out what was going to be needed to get the scripts happening, which I would not have figured out otherwise. And that was several years ago using MuseScore 3. But since then, I understand a lot has gone on under the hood. And now MuseScore 4 is out. So before we get into some of the details of how that works a lot better with accessible technologies, why don't you give our listeners an overview of what MuseScore does and what it's used for? Certainly. Um, so MuseScore is music notation software, and the way I might normally describe that is it's like a word processor for sheet music. So it is designed to produce printed music, you know, ovals and sticks on a, on a staff, the type of music that sighted musicians read. And uh, I hold on to that thought because it will be something to talk about regarding Braille coming up. But um, that is its main purpose. But even though the output of MuseScore is printed music, it's often the case that uh, blind musicians might want to use it because they might want to produce music for sighted musicians to read. They might also just want to use it for its playback capabilities because it will play the music you enter into it. So that's what MuseScore is for. It's uh, produce printed music and also play the results. And although this is an open source program, it is quite comparable to some of the commercially available programs like Sibelius and Finale that can produce full symphonic scores in detail. It absolutely is. I mean, often open source software is seen as, well, this is sort of the low grade imitation of whatever it's trying to uh, be. But MuseScore really has turned into a major player in the market now. So there's Finale, Sibelius, and another uh, relative newcomer, Dorico. Um, but MuseScore is definitely on, you know, close to equal footing with those despite being free and those being pretty expensive packages. And now it's fully accessible with Mac and PC computers. Walk us through the transition from MuseScore 3 and what happened to make it more accessible in MuseScore 4. Yeah, so MuseScore 3, it was all developed in a programming framework called Qt, or Qt, which has a certain way of interfacing with the accessibility system on your computer. And the person who did the original support for screen readers, he got it to work with NVDA only. and Frankly, that's all at the time we were like thrilled that we were able to get that going. But the approach that he used, I'm not going to say that it couldn't have worked with any other screen reader, but we never figured out how to get it to work with any other screen reader. When MuseScore 4 started to be a thing, I was not actually part of, of this at all. They essentially rewrote almost every part of the application that formerly used Qt. and they. Um, redid it in a related language called QML, which required re just rewriting large amounts of the user interface code, including the accessibility system. And 
since they had this opportunity to rewrite it using a new framework, they were able to do it in a way that basically it just worked with all screen readers out of the box just because of having a new framework and a new system to do it. So by rewriting it from scratch, it worked with everything. And again, just to reiterate, not only does it work with Windows PCs, but nowadays it also works on Mac computers, right? Yes. MuseCore itself has always worked on Windows as well as Mac, as well as Linux, which is also important because Linux is the system on which Chromebooks are running. The Chromebooks sort of run on top of Linux. So my main development system and the system I use every day is a Chromebook, and MuseCore runs on it and also is accessible on it. The, the Linux screen reader, Orca, works. And not only uh, does it work with NVDA and JAWS, on uh, Windows, but also now Narrator and VoiceOver on Mac and Orca on Linux. That is really great. Now, you put together some truly excellent tutorials using a screen reader to show how the new interface works and how people can get around. And it seemed like Tab and F6 keys were very important. Can you give us an overview of the new paradigm and what people should expect? I can definitely give you an overview, and I would love to pick your brain while we're at this if you have any insight here. One of the pieces of feedback that we got uh, about uh, MuseScore 3 is, you know, the interface was pretty cluttered. There'd be a window that had, say, 30 different buttons on it. And if you wanted to get to button number, you know, 21, you had to press tab 21 times to get there. And you know, the feedback we are getting is the way the interface is organized it's way too many presses of tab to find various different controls. And so at some point we hit on the idea, I'm not saying we invented this idea, it came to us from other software of kind of creating a hierarchical system where there would be different, I'll use the word panels, that's a word we use, different panels within the MuseScore window, and F6 is going to navigate between those panels. And then within a panel, we would have different groupings of controls, and tab will move you between those groupings. And then within a grouping, you'll use the cursor key to move between them. And the theory is that this is a more efficient way of getting around because you don't have to tab through every single control. You just hit F6 a couple times so you're in the right panel, hit tab a couple times so you're in the right grouping, and then cursor key a couple times until you're on the right control. That's the theory. The reality could be otherwise, and it's proving to be a learning experience for users as well as us. But our impression is that this is a valid model, um, but we're still working on the details, I would say. So I haven't used it except to test it out with some of the simple functions, but listening to your demos, it seemed like it worked fairly intuitively and pretty seamlessly. I was a little confused sometimes, although F6 moves from panel to panel, sometimes if you were at the end of a panel, hitting tab, in my mind, I would have expected to go back to the beginning of that same panel, but sometimes you would slip into the next panel. This is exactly what I mean when I say sometimes there's details left to kind of work out. Um, I think actually what you're describing is almost always true in MuseScore. In other words, I think tab will pretty much always take you on a complete tour. It won't cycle within a panel. Maybe it should. The thing is, there are other applications that use this hierarchical model and F6 and tab, but there's not a lot of them. And so there's not a whole lot of sort of existing, this is how it should work, where that we just do it the way everyone else does. It feels like everyone who's using this model is still feeling their way around as well. Yeah, I have seen that paradigm in other applications, but as you said, it's it's not very common, but it is very nifty. I think it works very easily. So tell us what these different panels are. Let's see. The main window of MuseScore that you're in most of the time has in it, there's a toolbar, uh, actually several different toolbars across the top of the window. And I'm going from memory right now. Um, so this is this is good. I'm just picturing it in my mind. On the left sidebar are three separate panels. There's uh, what the palettes, there's the uh, instruments panel, 
and there's the properties panel. And then there's also a bottom toolbar, which is, it's called the status bar. Um, and it used to just be for displaying information. It's basically would display what a screen reader would read. But now the status bar actually contains some controls as well. It's not just informational, but it's uh, interactive. Those are the panels that are always open, or at least open by default, but then there's some additional panels you can open up. There's a mixer, which is like an audio mixer with sliders to control the relative levels of the instruments. There's a navigation panel. There's two different navigation panels that help you kind of move around from one part of your score to another. And then there's various different dialogues that open as separate windows. But all those panels that I described, when they open, they're actually part of the main window. So they're part of the same tab order, basically. And you describe this as similar to a word processor. When it comes to entering notes, it's pretty easy to enter notes and all kinds of special markings that musical scorers have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so entering notes is definitely, uh, I would say, easy and as good as any other program that would do this. And it's going to feel very natural in many ways. Um, to be doing this with keyboard and screen reader because it's been highly optimized to work with keyboard, which if you think about it, if you know how music is normally notated, it is a little weird to think about how to enter music onto a staff using just a keyboard because so much of music notation is graphical in nature, the relative positions of things. Um, it's a little difficult to figure out the right way to go about entering music with keyboard alone, but you know we didn't have to invent that wheel. There were enough other programs like Finale and Sibelius that had found ways of doing it, and we were able to adapt their ways and maybe add some of our own. Uh, tweaks to it. So entering the actual notes onto your score with a keyboard is quite efficient, quite simple. Other markings that you might want to enter into your score, crescendo markings and accent markings and things like that, yeah, in an ideal world, you would have keyboard shortcuts for each one of those. But the reality is there's hundreds of them. So we can't realistically have a shortcut for every single one of them and expect people to remember them. So instead, there's a palettes panel. And on the palettes panel are all those symbols. And we have facilities to let you search the palettes, let you navigate the palettes to try to find the symbol you want. That is something that I will say does not work as seamlessly uh, to do by keyboard and screen reader alone. It's palettes by nature, our visual paradigm that you look at the thing, you see the palette, you see the symbol you want, and you click it. And turning that into a more linear keyboard and screen reader interface is clumsy, and it's something we would love to figure out a better solution for someday. And just to complicate matters, the size of some of these symbols makes a difference in terms of what it means. I'm thinking, you know, for example, a crescendo, if it's two measures long, it means you keep getting louder for two measures, whereas if it's a half a measure, that's very different. And so you need to specify the position in two dimensions as well as the size of many of these symbols. You're absolutely right about that. And this is one of the areas where I think think we do a reasonably good job. When I talked about the complications of making music notation into something you can enter linearly, part of it has to do with being able to select from one point in the music to another point in the music. And this is perfectly possible to do with keyboard shortcuts. And, and in fact, we borrow the word processor analogy a lot. If you want to select one word in a word processor, you have the cursor where you want it, and then you hit control right or command right, and that selects the word. Command or control right again extends the selection to the next word. Well, in MuseScore, those same commands will extend a selection of measure. So it's very simple to use the keyboard to select the measures that you want to apply that hairpin to, hairpin being a descriptive word for crescendo. But then the trick is if you have to go to the palettes to then find that crescendo, it slows you down. Luckily, crescendo is one of the symbols that does have a keyboard shortcut. So that one is relatively straightforward to add, but that one you sort of get lucky on that all the right things come together to make it easy to add. Because, yeah, there's a lot of other symbols that uh, won't work out nearly as conveniently. 
That's pretty neat that you were able to piggyback on all of the navigation keyboard equivalents from word processors. That's got to make it a lot easier to learn. I think so. And certainly a lot of the work that was done to do these things predated much of the accessibility work. In other words, it's not just for the sake of a blind user that we want to be able to make selections by keyboard. It's just a general uh, usability enhancement. It's an efficiency thing. Uh, Many people like to do operations with a keyboard if it's more efficient than a mouse. And it often is when we're not talking about something like the palettes where the mouse is clearly going to be more efficient, most things are easier to do by typing than by clicking. So uh, where possible, we wanted to take advantage of that for the benefit of everyone. So it sounds like you've made this very accessible, but nothing's perfect, but you're very amenable to suggestions from people and consider this a work in progress. Definitely. So as you mentioned Someone who's blind doesn't necessarily need a printed score unless they want to share it with other people, but they can actually listen to their music being played by the various instruments that are available with MuseScore. And you also talked about Braille. Yeah. So when I mentioned that the original work on accessibility was done by, it was a college student under my uh, mentorship as part of the Google Summer of Code, he did that work close to 10 years ago. When the pandemic hit, he was looking for a project to keep busy. He had he basically contributed that code and then sort of, you know, moved on You know, because MuseScore is a largely volunteer-based thing. People come, contribute some code, move on. He had moved on, but he just showed up one day and dropped a pile of code in our laps that said, here is Braille. And so MuseScore now, for the first time with MuseScore 4, can actually export Braille. Music Braille, that is. So if you create your score and you go to the the file menu, export, you can export to PDF, you can export to MP3, and you can export to Braille as well as other formats. The Braille export, from what I'm told, is pretty good quality-wise as far as how good of a job it does of representing the music and most of the markings in it, but it does not support text, which is a pretty big limitation because it means things like lyrics aren't in there. But for the representation of the music itself, other people have said, yeah, it's actually, as far as automatic Braille generation systems, it's one of the best they've seen. And you mentioned exporting to other formats. One of them is Music XML. So you can actually take some of these scores and import them into other programs in which you may want to work with them more. Absolutely. And so Music XML has always been kind of the ace in the hole for how to get extra capabilities in any music notation program, because you can take your score, export it to that format, and then load it into a program that does something. So there are some programs that can just automatically generate Braille from the Music XML, and those are really nice, including there's an online facility, Braille Muse, that I've used quite a bit. Um, But then there's also a whole suite of programs from a company called Dancing Dots, which is sort of the big name in the accessible music notation world. And they have a whole suite of tools designed to help you produce high quality Braille notation. Well, it sounds like you guys have done a great job making a very accessible and useful program for the blind community out there. Thanks. Thank you. And there's Uh, Another like really, really new, like only in the last two days or three days have I known about this, but there's now been another individual or maybe a small group of individuals who have integrated MuseScore with a library called uh, LibLuis. So it's able to take things that otherwise would have been displayed on a screen and display them on, on a Braille display or otherwise, you know, export to Braille and so forth, Braille formats. There's work underway now and a test version of this that was made available a couple of days ago that integrates this into MuseScore so that as you're working with MuseScore, you can have a, a panel open up that will display the actual Braille cells and then for the music itself in real time and also, of course, then translate that into a Braille display. Great. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Now for this week's final item, 
how to learn more about MuseScore, how to get it, and how to contact Mark Sabatella. Well, Mark, if people want to try out MuseScore, where would they find it? So the place you get MuseScore is MuseScore.org. And I have to emphasize the .org as opposed to .com. MuseScore.com is a, is a website for sharing the scores that you create, but it's not where you download the software from. It's where you download sheet music from. And where can people find the great tutorials that you put together for using MuseScore with a screen reader? So on MuseScore.org, yes, there's a menu across the top of the screen, and one of the items in the menu is support. And under the support menu uh, is the handbook, which has the, the most of the, the traditional documentation, but also in the support menu is accessibility that has a special section specifically for accessibility. And there's also information in the handbook for accessibility. So if you go to the accessibility section under support, it's gonna bring up a page with information about general accessibility resources and so forth. And that will include links to uh, my video tutorials. And of course, we talked about the MuseScore forum, which was useful for me in the old days. Yes, and that is still there also in the support menu. You'll see the handbook, you'll see the forums, and you'll see the, uh, the accessibility page. And the accessibility page is sort of like a one-stop shop for all the different accessibility resources. And I think you also do some online teaching. If people had questions for you or wanted to take some lessons over the internet, how would they go about that? So my website is masteringmusescore.com. So all one word, masteringmusescore.com. And so I offer a course called Mastering MuseScore 4 that is you know, to teach you MuseScore 4. And I have designed the course to be as accessible as I reasonably can. It's a video-based course, and I have a number of blind students who have given me feedback and helped me improve it over the years. Mark, you mentioned that you also do some other teaching and tutorials, and how would people find out about that if they're interested? I have a number of courses for teaching music, including one that I'm running right now called Basic Music Theory. There's also a Harmony course, and there's a CounterPoint course and other courses that I run from time to time. These are also courses that have been designed to be as accessible as possible. Uh, again, they're largely video-based, but I try to be very conscious about the fact that I have blind students in them. Uh, you will find through MasteringMuseScore.com. When you go to that website, you'll find a place to like sign up for my newsletter and you'll get, you know, a couple of emails with more information. Uh, but you'll you'll discover how to access the different courses that way. And as usual, we'll have all of that contact information in the show notes associated with this episode, which is 2316 at www.eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be speaking with Greg Daniel, who spent his career as a computer programmer for over 35 years and was also the Ohio State University Marching Band's first completely blind member long before inclusivity was a common practice. We'll talk with Greg about his education, his career, and what keeps him busy in retirement. So thanks for joining us this week, and we hope you'll join us next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.